In 1903, the Wright brothers made the world's first motorised flight, kick-starting the age of aviation. Or did they? I don't know that we really have photographic proof of the airplane flying in 1903. When I found out that the Wright brothers' story is really nothing more than a myth, I was upset. I don't like people lying to me. Australian aviation expert and historical researcher John Brown is on a quest to reassess aviation's most coveted prize. There's now solid evidence that not the Wright brothers, but Gustav Whitehead was the first person to fly a powered airplane. Could German inventor Gustav Whitehead be the true contender for the crown? It's a claim that has outraged many. There is no evidence that I buy to suggest that he ever left the ground. Including the Wright brothers. Whitehead did not possess sufficient mechanical skill to build a successful motor. He had delusions. Alice! Was Gustav Whitehead a deluded fantasist or a genius discredited by his rivals? I know he flew. It flew so easily for me. Did the Wright brothers deceive the world? Was history fixed by a special arrangement with America's greatest scientific institution? This contract dictates what version of history the museum is allowed to state. If the price of telling the truth is losing the right flyer, to me, a museum tells the truth. The Wright brothers or Gustav Whitehead? Who really kick-started the age of aviation? Flight, one of humanity's greatest achievements. It's celebrated here in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Center stage is the plane that started it all. The Wright Brothers Flyer from 1903, long considered a national treasure. But is everything really as it seems? In 2011, an Australian aviation expert began research into the early history of flight. John Brown came across evidence that challenged the Wright brothers' version of history. Sensational pictures from the dawn of aviation, showing a motorized plane from the year 1901. As a pilot and aircraft builder, the first impression I had was, everything's in the right place, this plane can fly. The plane was built by the German aviator Gustav Whitehead. But who was this man? And did his plane actually fly? The rumor was that he'd flown as early as 1901, two years before the Wright brothers. So why isn't this plane also honored by the Smithsonian? In Munich, where he works as a specialist in aeroplane design, John Brown set out to uncover the truth. The first thing I did was I searched the internet archives that have newly become available and came up with several hundred articles that nobody had known about, about Gustav Whitehead. It was the beginning of Brown's five-year investigation into Gustav Whitehead's flights, taking him to museums, airfields, and archives on both sides of the Atlantic, revealing crucial new sources from five continents. Brown wanted to know, had one of the world's greatest inventors been deliberately erased from history? As he continued to dig, he soon became immersed in a bitter dispute spanning more than 80 years over one of the greatest honors in history, the world's first powered flight. In the 1930s, several aviators were competing for the coveted first flight crown. The most fervent contender was Orville Wright, who claimed that he and his late brother Wilbur had made the first motorized flight in December 1903. 
But in 1934, Come in. researcher and writer Stella Randolph became aware nice of an explosive right document that challenged Orville Wright's version of history. You mentioned an interesting article? Take a look. It's in a special collection, early aviation. The New York newspaper report was from 1901, detailing a flight by the German aviator Gustav Whitehead in Bridgeport, Connecticut. She was fascinated. Her father had been a fan of the Wright brothers. And she looked at this and said, well, this article is about a man flying in 1901 two years before the Wright brothers. So at the height of the Great Depression, a single woman on a low salary decided to research the story of Gustav Whitehead. By 1937, Stella had expanded the article into a controversial new book, detailing the names of people who'd actually seen Whitehead fly. It contained 11 sworn eyewitness accounts by people attesting to Whitehead's flights before the Wright brothers. And this book changed the perception of early aviation history quite considerably. But when the Second World War came along, uh, Stella Randolph's efforts to prove that a German had flown before an American weren't well received. Until her death in 1989, Stella Randolph campaigned to have Whitehead formally recognised. But her evidence fell on deaf ears. In 1948, the Smithsonian and the US government recognised the Wright brothers as the fathers of aviation. And today, in Kitty Hawk, where the Wright brothers flew, more than half a million people pay their respects every year. So what had happened to Stella's claim that Whitehead flew first? As Brown expanded his research, he began to suspect that there was a darker side to this story. He discovered an article written in 1945 by Orville Wright, quoting one of Whitehead's leading contemporaries. Whitehead never succeeded in making any airplane flights. He was eccentric, a visionary and a dreamer, to such an extent that he actually believed what he merely imagined. Today, America's foremost scientific institution is inclined to agree. Did Gustav Whitehead fly? You can't say no. You can't prove a negative. But I don't think the evidence has come even close, not within a country mile of indicating that he had flown. So if he did fly, um, the evidence to prove it is still out there someplace. We haven't seen it. John Brown was not going to leave any stone unturned. In search of new evidence, he traveled to the German town of Leutershausen, where Whitehead was born in 1874. A local museum is dedicated to the achievements of the German aviator whose original name was Gustav Weisskopf, before he changed it to Whitehead in the US. The main item in the collection is a full-scale replica of Whitehead's plane, the number 21. And what Brown discovered from it was overwhelming. There are two ways of looking at this plane. The first thing <laughs> that's conjured up is it looks a bit like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. But the remarkable thing about Whitehead is he had a monoplane, and most airplanes these days aren't biplanes anymore. So he was ahead of his time on that. And the layout, the way the four vectors are juxtaposed to each other, is reminiscent of modern airplanes. There's not much we do differently these days. We have different materials, but we don't have different physics and science. The museum is run by a group of local aviation historians who believe that history needs to be corrected in favor of Whitehead. Their archive is a treasure trove on Whitehead's life, including background on his formative years. Even in his youth, Gustav was dreaming of flying. 
as his younger brother Nicholas wrote. About Gustav the Youth, I only remember that his hobby was to fly little open balloons and parachutes with attached corks or candles. On the other side of the Atlantic, in Dayton, Ohio, Whitehead's future competitors, the brothers Wilbur and Orville Wright, were equally fascinated by flight. Uh, you think that's good? Yeah. A flying toy, popular in the 1870s, left a profound impact on Orville as a child. Two, one. A toy so delicate, it only lasted a short time in the hands of small boys. But its memory was abiding. What the Wrights and Whitehead also had in common was their interest in the German design engineer, Otto Lilienthal. Lilienthal on first appearance would have been one of these cranks that, that they always show when they show the people who failed in flight when the things go straight down, because what he did was he built a set of wings and he ran down the hill and glided. That seems like almost like a comedy routine. But before he did that, Lilienthal had taken tens of thousands of measurements of airfoils, which is the shape of a wing, to determine which would be the most efficient shape to glide. He made 2,000 glides. So in fact, rather than being one of these weird cranks, he turned out to be the pioneer that inspired the Wright brothers and just about everyone else. Lilienthal's revolutionary glider design left its mark. One day, it would also become the basis of Whitehead's plane. Whitehead basically did what Lilienthal had planned to do. He basically just put an engine on the Lilienthal glider. The only thing he had to change to do that, of course, is he had to put this fuselage in here, mainly to house the engine. And Whitehead himself, he stood here just behind the engine. And from there, he steered the plane. Here in his hometown, Gustav Whitehead is far from forgotten. A memorial commemorates him for having conducted the world's first motorized flight. Andy, how are you? Overseas, there are others who share this view, including the US state of Connecticut. In Bridgeport, physics teacher Andy Koch and his team built a replica of Whitehead's number 21 back in the 1980s. He claims he has proven that Whitehead's plane could fly. Well, I heard about it uh, at a lecture at the Fairfield Historical Society, and I said, gee, this looks like a hang glider. I think I could build this airplane. We need a safety wire on here to make sure the wind can't blow this upside down. I started all by myself, and people wandered into the hangar and offered to help. Many of these people were older men in their 70s and 80s, but they knew the story of Gustav Whitehead very well. They'd learned it from their parents. Some of them even knew people who had seen Gustav Whitehead fly. So they joined in with me and we built this replica. We took it out to Bridgeport Airport, started taxiing, just moving along the ground. Then it just leapt off the ground so simply. A decade later, the Leutishausen Museum's replica also flew successfully. Evidence that Whitehead had designed a plane capable of flight two years before the Wright brothers. But it doesn't prove that Whitehead flew it in 1901. Critics say that Whitehead couldn't possibly have manufactured aviation engines to get his plane off the ground. This criticism harks back to a quote in Orville Wright's scathing article. Whitehead did not possess sufficient mechanical skill to build a successful motor. He had delusions. So, was Whitehead a dreamer or a genius ahead of his time? Brown now focused on this question. I need to bring in the builder and the negative. 
Vielen Dank. How could a poor young man from small town Bavaria acquire the skills to produce engines that would usher in the age of aviation? Germany in the 1880s was one of the world's industrial powerhouses. According to recently discovered articles from the 1950s, young Whitehead trained as a fitter at one of Germany's leading engine production companies. Yet Gustav never lost sight of his passion, flight. The question was where to pursue it and still make a living. The answer was a job at sea on ships between Europe and the Americas. At the time, sailing boats were just starting to add engines. Working with the sails and working with the wind was one part of what he was doing during these years. The other part was keeping these engines running. Around 1894, Whitehead's years at sea came to an abrupt end. His ship ran into some trouble off the east coast of the United States in two separate places, the last one being Cape Cod, which is known as the ship's graveyard. That's when he decided to stay on land. Gustav Whitehead was 20 years old. From now on, he would be dedicated to the navigation of the skies. Brown's next stop was the United States to investigate how a poor immigrant became a leading pioneer of aviation. Newspaper articles from the 1890s led to the Blue Hills south of Boston and a remarkable discovery about Whitehead's first big job in aviation. He was employed here by America's oldest aviation organization called the Boston Aeronautical Society and it was the official representative of Otto Lilienthal, the German glider designer, uh, here in the United States. And Whitehead was the one who built all of the Lilienthal gliders and all of the weather kites that were tested here. At last, Whitehead was able to follow his true calling. Responsible for constructing Lilienthal's pioneering gliders, his work was publicized in the New York Herald in 1897. Soon after, the young aspiring aviator married and moved to Pittsburgh, embarking on one of the most controversial periods of his life. By day, the 25-year-old worked as a steelworks engineer. But at night, in his workshop, he constructed lightweight engines to attach to his gliders. That'd be the fire. He later claimed it was here in Pittsburgh he first attempted to fly a motorized plane. His critics say the Pittsburgh flight is a whitehead fantasy. Yet in 1934, Stella Randolph was able to track down a witness who had been in the plane as it became airborne. Please. I flew with Mr. Whitehead on the occasion when he succeeded in flying his machine propelled by steam motor. Mechanic Louis Darverich stated that he and Whitehead flew the plane half a mile down a Pittsburgh street. But this 1899 flight was regarded as nothing more than an attempt because despite being airborne, the plane crashed. So who should we believe? The critics or the testimony of Louis Daverich? To check, Brown and researcher Paul Beck studied archival material unavailable to Stella Randolph. Just one year ago, nothing was known about what Whitehead did in Pittsburgh except what Stella Randolph had come up with in the 1930s. Now we have more than 30 articles about what he did there. We know where he took off, and we also know where he crash-landed this plane, so we can confirm that it was a level flight or close to level flight. So 
This is the first time I've come to Pittsburgh. It's the first time I'm going to see where Gustav Whitehead made his first powered flight attempt. So it's all very interesting and very exciting. Next day, Brown and Paul Beck team up with local historian John Sharkovsky to visit the site. Leading up here, according to all the articles, is the location of where Gustav would have taken off, which is McGee Woman's Hospital, where I was born. We'll take it off, coming on a 45 degree angle, that slope, straight down the Wilmot Street, which is where he crashed right into the building straight ahead. Right. Where exactly did he hit? Uh, approximately right where the tree is today. Brown is convinced. If Whitehead's plane hadn't hit this building, the age of motorized flight would have begun in December 1899, a point never acknowledged in mainstream histories. Instead, the enduring story is that the Wright brothers were the pioneers of aviation. As young men in the 1890s, they started a successful business manufacturing and renting out bicycles. The demand for this latest invention was huge. It laid the foundation for what would become one of America's most famous partnerships. They were two very distinct people, very complex personalities. Thanks, boys. Wilbur was a genius. He was one of the great instinctive scientists this country has ever produced. Orville was a great technician, a great craftsman. He could build things. But Orville did not have Wilbur's genius. After 1899, the Wright brothers also began to develop flying devices. But they needed lightweight engines for their gliders, just like the ones invented by Whitehead. And here, the two stories briefly intertwined. Around the time of the Pittsburgh flight attempt, Wilbur Wright received a letter from engineer Octave Chanute recommending Whitehead's engines. Wilbur responded enthusiastically. The 10 horsepower motor you referred to is certainly a wonder if it weighs only 30 pounds. Even if the inventor miscalculates by 500%, it still would be an extremely fine motor for aerial purposes. Yours truly, Wilbur Wright. By 1901, Whitehead and his young family had moved to Bridgeport, Connecticut. How much longer will you be? One more long night. Whitehead had secured local investment to fund a new plane design that was taking up all his time. Did the Wright brothers know about this work? During her research, Stella Randolph found two witnesses who claimed they saw the Wright brothers visit Whitehead's shop. In a sworn affidavit, one of them describes the scene in extraordinary detail. I, Cecil A. Steves, declare the following to be fact to my best knowledge and belief. When a boy, I lived only one block from the late Gustav Whitehead. It was here that the Wright brothers visited Mr. Whitehead during the early 1900s, coming from Ohio under the guise of offering to help finance his inventions. It's very lightweight. They actually received inside information that aided them materially in completing their own plane. I was at the shop with him when they arrived and waited outside while they talked inside. After they'd gone away, Mr. Whitehead turned to me and said, Now since I have given them the secrets of my invention, they will probably never do anything in the way of financing me. This proving to have been a true prophecy. Steves repeated his story to another researcher in 1966, but for some reason it has never gained traction with mainstream historians. That just isn't true. Unlike Whitehead, 
the rights, I mean, documented everything, not only in diaries and letters and that kind of thing, but their father's diary. And when people adamantly claim they were, I saw them, I just say nonsense, and I see that as proof that I'm not going to give a whole lot of credence to the rest of what you say, because I know that's not true. What we do know for certain is that in the summer of 1901, Gustav's work on his new plane was progressing steadily. I should have this working in no time. The result was the plane first seen by John Brown in 2011, Gustav's 21st flyer, which he called the number 21. The design was based on one of the tried and tested Lilienthal gliders that he built, but bigger and with an undercarriage and two propellers. Whitehead decided to pilot the plane himself, risking his life once again to become the first man to achieve motorized flight. At the same time, 600 kilometers south of Bridgeport, the Wright brothers were still experimenting with unpowered gliders, harnessing the strong coastal winds of Kitty Hawk for their glides. After two years of experimenting, an engine was attached to one of their flyers. A first attempt on the 14th of December 1903 ended in a crash. But the flyer was soon repaired. Three days later, on the 17th of December, the Wright brothers tried again. According to Orville Wright's diaries, this time the brothers were successful. It's a story well known to historians and school children around the world. They made four flights that morning. The first one was only 120 feet in a little over 12 seconds. They took turns and uh, Orville made the first flight, so Wilbur made the fourth flight. And on that flight, he traveled 870 some feet in 59 seconds. He was in the air almost a minute. And that was enough to convince them that they had achieved sustained flight. The Wright brothers conducted their experiments in great secrecy. Back in the early 1900s, many people doubted their story. To answer their critics, Orville released this photograph five years after the event in 1908. That was one of the most reprinted, historically significant pictures of all time, the very first flight. And when you look at the first flight photo, you will see that the flyer is off of the ground. But how much can we trust the Wright brothers' photographs? Visiting Kitty Hawk is aeronautical design and performance engineer, Joe Bulmer. Bulmer is an expert in the secret analysis of foreign aircraft and reported to the US Defense Department, Congress, and the White House. He has discovered disturbing inconsistencies in the Wright brothers' photographic evidence. The Wright brothers had a criteria that unless you flew at least a tenth of a kilometer, 328 feet, that you hadn't proven anything. In fact, Wilbur said that any flight shorter than, than 300 feet would be just a jump in the air and uh, proved nothing, and he used the word nothing. But this flight is portrayed by many to be the first successful flight. But in fact, the airplane only went about a third of the distance that they felt was a minimum for a success. And as you can see, this uh, elevator here is at the full up position. That was a problem because it was pivoted too far back and it would flop either one way or the other completely. And that's why Orville went up, down, almost hit the ground, went up again, and then hit the ground on the second time he came down. So this flight, uh, really by the Wright brothers' criteria, at the time, was not a success. According to Wilbur Wright's own criteria, the first three flight attempts were too short to qualify as successful. But the fourth flight did qualify, travelling 
852 feet. So what is the evidence for this? This is supposedly a picture of the fourth flight. But the propeller blades are clearly visible. So the engine was stopped. And the airplane appears to be either on the ground or within a foot of it. So this is at or very near the end of the flight. Now, the Wright brothers claim that that airplane on that flight went 852 feet in 59 seconds. However, the mensuration using standard trigonometric and geometric techniques shows that airplane to be between 300 and 340 feet from the takeoff point, not 852. Not only that, when we look at the picture in detail, we notice the wing is bent with the tips a little bit lower. Now that's characteristic of the 1903 airplane. But the next thing is that there are these three dark blobs on there. What are they? The question is puzzling. Close-ups of the Wright Brothers 1903 flyer show a horizontally mounted engine and a low-lying pilot. Nothing that would look like three blobs from a distance. In contrast, this footage of a Wright Brothers two-seat flyer flown in 1908 shows two people sitting next to an upright engine. Three blobs from a distance. So these three blobs are much more consistent with the 1908 airplane than the 1903. The Wrights did bring the two-seat model of their aircraft to Kitty Hawk in 1908, and they flew it dozens of times over the course of a month and a half. So I really am not 100% sure what I'm looking at here, <laughs> whether, it's, whether it is in fact a 1903 shot. I don't think the photography by itself proves that they had success. Joe Bulmer's analysis suggests that proof of the Wright brothers' flight of 852 feet relies essentially on the journal and writings of one man, Orville Wright. One of the key issues in the early years of powered flight is, can we verify that they did what they said they did? How reliable are they? and how reliable were the people who claimed to be witnesses to what they did. Now, in the Wright brothers' case, they were out in Kitty Hawk with a couple of locals who lived in shacks, and Orville claimed his fourth flight was 852 feet. There is no independent verification, except the Wright brothers did not lie. And there it goes! So do attempts to replicate the 1903 flight vindicate Orville Wright's story? He's working hard. Ah, crap. No one has had any success duplicating the fourth flight. In fact, the farthest that I know of that anybody's flown a Wright replica is about 130 feet. Many people have gotten injured flying replicas of Wright flyers, and two people got killed. Five months after Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers invited the press to a demonstration of their latest flyer near Dayton, Ohio. The day was a disaster as the plane failed to fly. Yet by 1905, the Wright brothers managed to get a modified version of their biplane into the air. These first moving pictures of a Wright plane were taken in 1908. By now, the Wright brothers had taken out a lucrative aviation patent for their control system. With that patent, they tried to either keep people out of the aviation business or take 10% of whatever they made from aviation. They ended up spending a lot of time suing other people. One long wrangling case went to two appeals. The judge that adjudicated their case admitted that he 
was favorable to the Wrights because they were the uh, pioneers of aviation, as he put it. For the Wright brothers, it seems to have not been so much about inventing the airplane as about making money. That's quite well illustrated when you see what happened after they demonstrated their airplane. They put no effort into developing the airplane further. They put all their effort into suing everybody else who tried to fly an airplane. Wilbur died in 1912. But by the 1920s, his surviving brother Orville was busy writing the history of aviation, placing himself and his late brother at the centre of the story. Based on the Kitty Hawk flights, Orville built a strong reputation and profitable business. The nation's tribute to the father of aviation. But in the mid-1930s, Stella Randolph's book detailing Whitehead's lost flights threatened to torpedo Orville's reputation. At the heart of her book was a long-forgotten eyewitness account attributed to the respected journalist Richard Howell in the Bridgeport Sunday Herald, published more than two years before the Wright brothers claimed flights at Kitty Hawk. Howell's account began in the early hours of the 14th of August, 1901, as Whitehead was heading for a field near his home in Bridgeport. He wrote, By this time, the light was good. The nervous tension was growing at every clock tick. You really think you can get this thing to fly? Just you watch me. Well, good luck. Start the engine. It was an exciting moment. And Alice! The machine darted up through the air like a bird released from a cage. The newspaper man and the two assistants stood still for a moment, watching the airship in amazement. She was flying now about 50 feet above the ground. According to Howell's article, Whitehead flew half a mile that day. Stella Randolph knew this evidence was dynamite, but she also knew she had to find more proof to convince the world Whitehead had flown first. Travelling to Bridgeport in search of witnesses, she found people still talking about the German aviator 30 years later. Many claimed to have seen Whitehead fly on numerous occasions. I was present when Mr Whitehead succeeded in flying his machine, propelled by motor. The distance flown was approximately one mile and a half. The first flights made by Mr Whitehead lasted approximately five minutes time. Stella required that each witness make a sworn affidavit in front of a notary. She came up with 11 witness statements. This number and diversity of sources is something that would normally be referred to as clear and convincing evidence. This is way beyond a shadow of a doubt. When Stella Randolph published her book, she hoped Whitehead would be recognised as the aviator who made the world's first flight. But she hadn't banked on Orville Wright and his powerful family and friends. When in 1945, the Reader's Digest referred to Whitehead as the man who flew first, one of Orville's friends was alarmed. Reader's Digest, July, page 57. Whitehead, feel this should be dynamited. With much to lose in reputation, Orville set out to destroy the Whitehead story. Writing the influential 1945 article, The Mythical Whitehead Flight. First, Orville cherry-picked the one and only witness in Stella's book who said Whitehead hadn't flown. 
Uh, James Dickey worked with the late Gustav Whitehead. James Dickey was mentioned by name in the Bridgeport Sunday Herald as one of those present during the 14th of August flight. I believe the entire story in the Herald was imaginary. I was not present and did not witness any airplane flight on August 14, 1901. Brown believes Dickey's statement should be dismissed. Well, the thing about Dickey's statement is that Dickey, in the first few lines, says, no, I was not there. I was not present. Now, somebody who was not there is not a witness. I believe the entire story in the Herald was imaginary. So why did Mr. Dickey say this? Well, another thing that Mr. Dickey said was that Whitehead owed him money and then had never repaid him. Orville's second attack caused the most damage to Whitehead's reputation. Centred on an unsigned statement attributed to Whitehead's former collaborator, Stanley Beach. He paraphrased Beach, saying, Although Beach saw Whitehead frequently in the years from 1901 to 1910, Whitehead never told him that he had flown. Beach has said that he does not believe that any of Whitehead's machines ever left the ground. Brown believes that Beach's statement is questionable because it directly contradicts articles published when Beach was aeronautical editor of Scientific American. This is a very interesting article. It's almost three months to the day before the Wrights claim to have flown on December 17th of 1903. What it tells us is that Whitehead attached this 10 horsepower motor to this glider. The plane was made to skim above the ground without the pilot touching the ground for about 350 yards, about 300 meters. It appears that Beach changed his story about Whitehead's flights after the two men publicly fell out in 1909. Conveniently, Orville's article never mentioned the 11 eyewitnesses quoted by Stella who did see Whitehead fly. And by the 1960s, a total of 17 eyewitnesses had attested to Whitehead's flights. But the Smithsonian Institution remains unimpressed. We all know what problems there are with witness testimony. And I just discount the witness testimony. I, Anton Pruckner, uh, was acquainted with the late Gustav Whitehead and was employed by him in the construction of motors and heavier than air flying machines. Their memories were so vague, um, they weren't necessarily memories of a powered flight. I was present and assisted on the occasion when Mr. Whitehead succeeded in flying his machine, propelled by a motor. I was present when Mr. Whitehead succeeded in flying his machine, propelled by motor. The, the dates uh, in many of those are mixed up. 14th of August, 1901. September or October, 1901. In his scathing article, Orville also attacked Howell's eyewitness account of Whitehead's first flight. The strangest part of all is that anyone should think that Howell's article should be taken as fact. I think the article in the August 18th Bridgeport Sunday Herald may have been Richard Howell listening to Whitehead talk and just putting it down on paper. It may well have been something like that that just got out of hand. Brown disagrees. He believes the article and the later affidavits are reliable. The evidence for Whitehead's first flight is overwhelming. Besides the chief editor of the local newspaper, there are two other witnesses who confirm having seen Whitehead fly on August 14th of 1901. We know now that all four competition newspapers in Bridgeport also reported Whitehead's first flight. In 1901, he made a flight in an airship of the aeroplane type. He has demonstrated that his machine can fly. Mr. Whitehead made two successful flights recently. Since that time, two more flights have been made. 
Here's a very recent find. It's the front page of the competing newspaper in Bridgeport, the Bridgeport Evening Post. This article appears to be a description of Whitehead's second flight and confirms in another newspaper that Whitehead successfully flew at the trotting park in the west end of Bridgeport. Brown has discovered nearly 300 syndicated articles published around the world reporting Whitehead's 1901 flight. But 40 years after the event, Orville Wright's scathing article had its effect and helped to sideline the late German aviator who threatened the Wright brothers' status. In Washington, the Kitty Hawk... In 1948, the Smithsonian Institution and the US government officially recognised the Wright brothers as the world's first aviators. Since then, the Wright brothers' 1903 flyer has been the showpiece of the Smithsonian's flagship aviation exhibition. The Wright brothers' achievement stands. But if Gustav Whitehead achieved a semblance of powered flight earlier, he should be recognized for that, and he should be recognized by America's preeminent scientific museum. In 2013, Gustav Whitehead was recognized as the first to achieve powered flight by both the state of Connecticut and the world's oldest aviation journal, Jane's All the World's Aircraft. So why won't the Smithsonian consider Whitehead as a serious contender for the aviation crown? What the world didn't know is that in 1948, behind closed doors, the Smithsonian entered into a special contract with the Wright estate. Revealed only because of a Freedom of Information request back in 1976, the contract stipulates that the museum must never claim that any other aircraft flew before the Wright brothers in 1903. This contract dictates what version of history the museum is allowed to state. And it actually specifies that the US National Museum is never allowed to say that somebody else flew before the Wright brothers. I think it's unfortunate that a great museum such as the Smithsonian would be contractually bound to what is perhaps a lie. So long as the Smithsonian wishes to display the right flyer, a major drawcard to the museum, it remains bound by the contract. So how did this contract come into being? For 40 years, the Smithsonian had backed a plane built by its former secretary, Samuel Langley, as the first capable of flying. But following relentless pressure from Orville Wright to correct the record, the Smithsonian finally caved in and the contract was signed. Well, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an historian. And when I look at the contract, what I see um, is sort of an important monument to a moment in time, uh, having nothing to do with other first flight claimants, but having to do with those years when the Smithsonian uh, was in fact not playing fair at all uh, to the right. So will the institution ever scrap the contract, paving the way for a truly independent assessment of history? Whether the Smithsonian were ever to reject the contract is above my pay grade. But if it was my decision, I wouldn't do it. If the price of telling the truth is losing the right flyer, to me, a museum tells the truth. Whatever the final judgment on Gustav Whitehead's flights, his recorded words were prophetic. I have no doubt flying machines will be as common as automobiles in a few years' time. And before you and I are old men, there will be more traveling through the air than there are on land or water. But back in 1902, Whitehead needed money to make his plane commercially viable. Unlike the Wright brothers, he was unlucky in business. An investor called in a loan. Mark off! This 
is my shop! Linda! Locked out of his workshop, Whitehead never fully recovered. By the time Stella Randolph was researching her book on the lost flights of Gustav Whitehead, the German aviator had disappeared into the fog of history. He spent the later years of his life constructing aviation engines. In 1927, Whitehead died in relative obscurity and was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave. And so we are left with the story of the Wright brothers. When they first flew in front of a movie camera, we have believed their version of history, that the Wright brothers flew first at Kitty Hawk in 1903. Today, the standing of the Wrights is as formidable as ever, handed down through generations. Achieved by dauntless resolution and unconquerable faith. And protected by a contract signed by the Smithsonian Secretary on behalf of the United States of America. If somebody ever came up with creditable evidence that I could buy that someone had flown before the rights, I'd admit it. Seven separate flights have been documented in contemporary newspapers and magazines predating the Wright's first claimed flight. We have the 17 witness or testimonial sources. This is way beyond a shadow of a doubt. The current history of aviation needs to be re-evaluated. Who flew first? 80 years after Stella Randolph's investigations, the battle lines remain clearly drawn between two camps. At stake is the truth and a fundamental principle, credit where credit is due.